Rachel Mellon Skemp was 13 years old when she went missing after staying home from school one day in 1996 because of a sore throat. She was curled up in a blanket with pillows when she went missing later that day. 26 years later, there's no trace of her. Not even the blanket or the pillows have been found. But detectives did find a disturbing diary entry written just days before she vanished, and it might reveal her kidnapper. Rachel Mellon Skemp was born in October of 1982. She lived in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and attended the Bernard J. Ward Middle School. While she was doing great in school, her home life was a much darker story. Rachel had been the victim of abuse for most of her childhood. Her parents, Jeff and Amy Skemp, had split up when Rachel was very young, less than three years old. By 1985, Amy had moved on to someone else, a man named Vincent Mellon. Vincent offered to take Rachel in and raise her as his own, hence how her last name ended up being hyphenated as Mellon Skemp. Amy and Vincent had been together for around five years when the true colours of Vincent had begun to show. It was 1990 when things began to take a turn for the family. Vincent and Amy had been arguing when Vincent began to grow more and more angry. In a fit of blind rage, he backed Amy up to the staircase of their home and pushed her down the stairs. Amy went tumbling down, but thankfully she wasn't injured too badly. After she recovered, she went straight to the police and filed for a restraining order against Vincent, which appears to have been granted to her. Before long, though, Amy decided that she wanted to make amends with Vincent and decided to drop the charges against him. Their reignited love didn't last long, and Vincent very quickly put an end to what could have been a new beginning when he continued his abuse towards the family, now turning his attention towards Rachel as well. By 1995, Rachel had finally had enough. She was only 12 years old when she ran away from home. She kept running until she made her way to a friend's house. She never went inside the house, and it doesn't even seem like she ever knocked on the door. She found a safe place outside the home and slept there for the night, waiting until the next morning to reach out to her grandparents for help. Her grandparents showed up and took her home placing her right back into the hands of her cold and callous abuser. Later that summer, Rachel was allowed to spend a few weeks with her biological father, who now lived in Texas. While she was in Texas, she begged her uncle to allow her to move to Dallas. It doesn't seem like she explained the full details of the situation to him, because surely he would have helped her out if he'd known just how bad things truly were. But unfortunately, her pleas fell on deaf ears. No matter how hard Rachel begged, she was later forced to go back home to live with her mother and the living, breathing monster that she called her stepdad. A few months later, in January of 1996, her best friend Carrie found her crying by her locker. This wasn't something Rachel had ever done before. This was the last time that any of her friends would ever see Rachel. After she left school that day, she never returned. She called in sick the following day with a sore throat then she vanished. It was January 30th, 1996. Rachel was home from school alongside her stepdad, Vincent, who had been unemployed for a while. This was a particularly chilly winter day, with temperatures reaching around negative 20. With strong gusts of wind and snow flurries, Rachel and her stepfather were essentially snowed in with nowhere else to go. After about an hour, Vincent says that Rachel decided to go to her room for a nap. She was wearing yellow pants, red slippers, and a pink sweatshirt. She wrapped herself in a blue blanket, hopped onto her bed, and went to sleep. This was allegedly the last time anyone saw Rachel, but her story only gets more twisted and disturbing from here. At around 2.30pm, Vincent says that he checked in on Rachel and noticed that she was still sleeping. By 3.15pm, Rachel's young stepsister had returned home from school and immediately noticed that Rachel was missing from her bedroom. Her sister asked about her, but Vincent wasn't concerned. Between 4.30 and 5 o'clock p.m., Amy, Rachel's mother, returned home around this same time alongside their son, Jason. When Amy noticed that Rachel was missing, she immediately called the police to help investigate. When police arrived at the family's home a couple hours later, they began their investigation with a search of Rachel's bedroom. It didn't take them long to realise that something wasn't quite right here. The evidence that had been left behind, coupled with the information that Vincent provided, just didn't add up. 
something was wrong, and the police were determined to get to the bottom of it. Police found several key pieces of evidence that pointed to word Rachel being kidnapped. But investigators soon noticed something very strange. Vincent's arms had been covered in scratch marks, some of which looked quite painful. When the detectives asked where these marks had come from, he said that he'd been working on a car earlier that day and had gotten scraped and cut while reaching inside the engine bay. An intense search of the area was conducted by police, both on the ground and by air. No signs of Rachel ever turned up. Police even went as far as checking with local airports to make sure that she didn't try to book a flight to Dallas to visit her father. But there was no sign of her during their investigation. But this is where things really begin to paint a chewing portrait of Vincent. Police began investigating Rachel's room and soon found her diary. She wrote in her diary quite often and would detail all of her emotions, experiences and her abuse. Police were particularly shaken by one particular page in which she revealed several crimes that her stepfather had committed against her. Rachel explained that one day, in August of 1995, Vincent had entered her room and had begun to kiss her. Among other things, according to her diary, Vincent said that he was doing this so that she would know how predators acted, so that she could avoid them. But there was no avoiding her father. Police also found an out-of-print book titled Daddy Kisses that details father-daughter relationships. But most chilling of all, police found one particularly shocking piece of evidence under Rachel's pillow, a knife. At 6pm on the evening that Rachel went missing, Carrie, Rachel's best friend, heard the news. Carrie gathered a group of friends from school and explained what had happened, and they all headed out to help search for her. They spent over an hour outside in the blistering cold, desperately searching for their lost friend, but they came up empty-handed. They searched all of the nearby streets and parks, but she had simply vanished. Carrie says that at this moment, all of the friends huddled together and began crying, realising that their friend was truly gone, but hopefully not forever. It was around this same time that Jeff Skemp, Rachel's biological father, received the call, telling him that his daughter was missing. Jeff quit his job, effective immediately, and got on the first flight that he could to Illinois, so that he could help search for her. Jeff says that while he was at Rachel's home, he confronted Vincent about what had happened. Jeff says that the only response that Vincent offered was that Rachel must have been snatched while he was out walking the dog. Ever since that day in 1996, Jeff has kept the same phone number, hoping that at some point, Rachel may try to reach out to him. But she never has. In January of 2000, a grand jury managed to retrieve a warrant to take DNA samples from Vincent. Police picked up Vincent from his home and kept him in custody for more than nine hours while they interrogated him and took the aforementioned samples. During their time speaking with Vincent, he refused to answer many of the questions pertaining to Rachel's disappearance. He was ultimately forced to hand over samples of his DNA and hair, and police had officially begun to investigate him under suspicion of first-degree murder. This investigation came after rumours had begun to spread, claiming that Rachel may have been pregnant and the baby may have belonged to Vincent. Granted, without Rachel being found, there's no tangible evidence to support this theory. However, the entries in Rachel's diary are seriously concerning. Vincent was also given a lie detector test, and he failed. Amy was questioned by police later on as well, but she found no reason to believe that Vincent may have been involved. This may have been because she was blinded by her love for him, or it could have been because she knew him better than anyone. And while he may have had his flaws, he wasn't a murderer. Amy was given a lie detector test as well, and she passed. But after this, both Amy and Vincent have refused to help police with the investigation, which was a seriously unexpected turn. They also both refused to hold any memorial services for Rachel. It wouldn't be until 2002 when the city of Bolingbroke took matters into their own hands, planting a tree and directing a plaque in honour of Rachel, placing it directly across the street from her former home. To take things a step further, the Bolingbroke Police Department has openly and clearly stated that they have every reason to believe that Vincent murdered his stepdaughter. However, without finding her body, they can't charge him. Her father Jeff and her best friend Carrie both have dedicated themselves at the forefront of this investigation. 
while Amy and Vincent have refused to help in any way since 1996. Neither Jeff nor Carrie have forgotten, and they continue to press on with bringing awareness to Rachel's disappearance, hoping that one day the case may finally see justice and Vincent will be arrested, or whoever Rachel's kidnapper was, if Vincent truly is proven to be innocent. The Bolingbroke police still consider the disappearance of Rachel Mellon Skemp to be an active investigation. So if you have any information in Rachel's case, you can reach out to the Bolingbroke police. Wherever Rachel may be, it's our hope and prayer that she finally found the peace that she so desperately had been longing for. 